communicating with people, redoing our brains to like peer through like the cultural window and see like the world, the minds of people who come from like a completely different culture than ours. It's such a gift and like such an amazing experience. How many can you speak fluently and feel like you can have an intelligent conversation with someone like this? Okay, so I, oh, like this? Only English. And Welcome back to another segment of Before We Hit Record. If you're watching on YouTube, which hopefully you are, then you can see this cool lady here with a really fun and art, like artsy background. Her name is Liz Wilcox. She is the fresh princess of email marketing. Obviously, she's an email strategist. She's a keynote speaker. She shows small businesses, people like you listening right now, how to build online relationships, package up their magic, and turn it into emails that people will want to read. And most importantly, purchase from, which I love that last part. So this, hi, Liz. Hey friends, I am so excited. This is so cool. I feel like I'm in, uh, like my Facebook group is called The Sound Booth. I feel like we're in the sound booth right now. This is like a making the video type of thing. <laughs> it really, really is. Like, And so this is before we hit record because all those cool people that I've interviewed in the past and now you, it's like we had good conversations to get to know each other, right? So like we could make a good podcast episode and like not have it be awkward, like just talking with a stranger that's a guest expert. And then I realized the audience needs to hear these conversations because we're more than just, I'm an online business owner and this is what I do. And I only have like one facet to my personality, which is my online business. It's like, we have like dreams and hopes and aspirations and fears and cool backstories and, you know, things we like and dislike and families and like partners and and we got to like talk about all this. So that's why we're having this um, segment. She says you should only be spending 20 minutes a week writing emails. And I know for me, let's just call me like the written word. I have difficulties with the written word. So I'm like, how can I achieve only 20 minutes? I would love it because truth be told, I'm just not doing any minutes right now because it's so intimidating. It's true. It's true. Um, I've tried many things like trying to have my team write the emails and then me look at them and I'm just email adverse. So I'm willing to, um, I can't wait to hear that from you on the next episode. And the listener will also enjoy like, how can we better connect with our audience via emails and what we're doing wrong in our email welcome sequences uh, so that we can improve conversion rate. So that's coming up in her guest expert episode in a moment um, after we get to know each other. If you don't know who I am, hi, I'm Quajo. I'm the new host of The Art of Online Business, but it's already been a moment though, five months. I'm just uh, applauding. I'm one of those like awkward applauders. I like applaud everyone and everything. But anyway, Quajo was about to say his awesome spiel about the art of online business and how he's taken it by storm in the last five months. Rick Mulready is no longer the host. And if uh, you want to know where he's at and what project he's working on, it's a really cool AI project. And if you're like, Quajo, who the heck are you? Well, there's another episode where uh, Rick was interviewing me and he shares why he chose me to be the new host. And um, if you don't listen to those episodes, know that the podcast remains largely the same. Tips and tricks and strategies and behind the scenes peaks. And of course, Facebook ads goodness to help you, an online course creator, scale your business up from low six figures to high six figures. And uh, with that, Liz, I like your golf cl golf claps. You would do well on the side of a golf course at the... I love it. Thank you. You know what? I am so excited to talk to Quajo today. And I think like he's on this opposite end of something I've done. I've actually sold a business. And part of that part of the package, uh, the new owners took over my live show. I did a live show on YouTube every Tuesday and they bought it in, um, March, 2020. They bought the business. It was an RV travel blog and they still do the live show today. So when I got hooked up with the art of online business and Quajo, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. Like something is living on. Like that's, I feel like that is true entrepreneurship when you can, when you're like buying and selling, when you create something and it lives on and it has this new identity and this new life. And so 
I have been loving the new identity of art of online business. So yes, golf clap all day for the new host. This is really exciting. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. It was intriguing when I was talking to Rick, like he was quite public about um, starting to, well, he was quite public about his struggles with burning out um, and then wanting to pivot, but not disguising a failure um, with the word pivot, like so many of us do, right? But actually his previous business is going just fine. I mean, that's, I was working as a coach inside of his um, accelerator that coached like high earning established online course creators. And his interests just were beginning to lie elsewhere. And so like when we had the chat, he was saying that like, he was just going to end the podcast. And I was like, well, why don't I take it over? And he was like, there's no one else that he would trust with the audience. But but me, you know, and I was honored when he told me that after work, I mean, we worked together for like three years. So as far as the consulting slash coaching in the online space, like he taught me most of what I know now, um, you know, minus some books that I read and other courses I took. So like, I'm, I'm still deeply indebted to him. Like, his spirit lives on in the art of online business. <laughs> That's so cool. And I, I, I love what you just said about you know, his interests were just lying elsewhere, but it's like, why let this thing just fizzle out, just die? And also like you coming from the community, like literally from the inside, the call is coming from the inside of the house. <laughs> um, like, I think that's so awesome because that's who I sold my business to. It was someone that had been on my email list, had been in my community for almost three years. And yeah, it was that same like, I don't know, it was just an easy transfer of not only the business, but like of energy. Like I knew that the thing that I envisioned, um, you know, it was going to be different, but it was going to live on and it was going to have that same like mission and vision. So were you scared when you were talking to this person to buy the, you said it was just an RV was it van life or RV life blog? R RV, RV life. Yeah, yeah. So was I scared? I, honestly, I was really intimidated. Uh, the people that bought my business are a lot older than me. They're professionals. Y'all, I've never had a job in my life. <laughs> like if you, if you can't tell. I mean, I've had, you know, like, I mean, real job. Like I've worked at, my last job was at a gas station. Like I've worked at any and every pizza place you could ever think of, but never had like a real like suit and tie, have to report to an actual professional. And so I'm talking to these people and they're like, oh, we're talking to our lawyer. And you know, what, are, what about this? And that it, the whole process felt intimidating to me, but it was one of those things, um, that I knew like, oh, this is going to help me grow. This is like just, you know, I, I don't know, like shedding my old layer to, you know, grow into something bigger. So yeah, it was scary. <laughs> it's me too. The the lawyer talk, the lawyer speak, the um, figuring out the contract, like not that like Rick was great to work, like to work with. And like, it was completely amicable, but then it's like, contracts in a way protect friends from each other you know like you're friends but you have to outline all these possible scenarios and things in the contract like that way like the friendship and the relationship is preserved and you just have to codify it it's like if this happens well then this will happen if this happens you agree that this will happen you know and you talk these things out so that there's and then write them in the contract so that there's no misunderstanding and at least that's the way it was explained to me to encourage me to just keep going because, man, when we were working out the contract, that was just a beast of a process. It is a beast. Yeah. And I, I think you're right. It's just it's just something you have to do because you never know, you know, like nobody wants the worst case scenario, but it is kind of this protection of, okay, we're going to stay in this box. And if this happens, like we've got an exit plan, we've got, you know, a second strategy. Um, and it just, I don't know, it's kind of like, by the end, I was like, oh, this feels like less intimidating and more like a security blanket. I know exactly what's going to happen in just about every scenario. And so now it's less intimidating. There's, you know, usually it's the fear of the unknown, right? And so, okay, I know everything now, so huh, I can, I can kind of release it. 
I feel like I uh, maybe did the listener a disservice by not teasing the fact that you set up your business to run itself for three months while you recorded on like the latest season of Survivor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That would have like hooked a lot more people in. I just might re-record the intro at the end of this episode. You could just put like a little clip of that, like, you know, shout out Survivor, CBS. Because that's huge. It is. Thank you. It feels big. Like, okay, so being on Survivor and it's filming right now, or I'm sorry, it's not filming, it's airing. We filmed in June 2023. And so it's airing on television and that feels really big. But even now, like seeing myself on TV, this morning I woke up and I'm starting to get these, like they call them fan cams. And so it's where somebody makes like a personal video of like clips from the show of you. And so like that feels exciting. But honestly, the most exciting part still is that I was able to take 90 days off of work. Like I don't know anyone else who has ever done that. Like, and this is not a, oh, I'm bragging or anything, but ser- like, I'm a single mom. I support three households with my one little LizWilcox.com business, okay? And for for me to be able to take off 90 days, like, and the bills are paid, the, the emails are emailing, <laughs> you know, like the automations are automating, like for everything to work and for me to not only go out in the jungle and play some silly like competition reality show, but when I came back, I was able to take two months off of work to like recover mentally and physically because y'all, that game is real. I know a lot of reality shows are really like twisted, not what you see. Like I'm still 10 pounds lighter than I was when I started the game. Like it is very real. But for me to be able to take that much time off, that's the most exciting part. Like, sure, getting on TV, to be honest, it was honestly pretty easy to get on the show. (laughs) Uh, It was honestly pretty easy to get onto the cast. All I did was apply. All I did was apply and they called me back, you know, hair toss. But like setting up your business in a way that is intentional, in a way that is oh my gosh, I'm going to go do this thing and not have to worry. Like that's freaking hard, right? But I think, uh, you know, this is, we're supposed to be talking about what I loved Quajo said earlier. He was like, this before we hit record stuff is about like who you are outside of your online business. And y'all, speaking of Survivor, that's something that I found out out there. I was like, wow, all of these people I'm meeting have hobbies, have you know, lots of friends have, you know, lifelong relationships. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm having a bit of an identity crisis. All I've done the last seven years is build my business. If you wish that I could just hop in to your Facebook ad manager and run your ads for you, or at least download all my three plus years of experience into your ads so that they would run the right way, you pretty much got your wish. There's a new offer that I made and my clients so far are loving it. It's called Facebook Ads to Success. And that means for you, I can coach you one-on-one so that you can successfully run your lead generation ad campaigns, your launch registration ad campaigns, even your sales funnel, SLO, self-liquidating offer funnel ad campaign. Here's how it will work. We will have three calls within 30 days. During the first call, I'm going to show you the exact ways to get your account running optimally. We'll do also like analytics setup if you don't have those set up right so that your ads can function the right way. We'll also look at your funnel and I'll point out to you the areas in your funnel that could be converting better. And I'll make recommendations about how to improve those areas of your funnel. And then if you have running ads currently, we'll look at those ads. Otherwise, we'll go through all the things you need to consider before setting up your ads. In between the calls, you get unlimited access to me. That means on Slack or Voxer or even Messenger, you get to record your screen or just send me an audio messages or type something, but ask about your ads and I'll be able to give you recommendations right there. And then we'll set up the ads and then I'll show you how I check up on ads and all the moves that I would make 
I'll walk you through those and teach you how to make those same moves so that you can successfully manage your own ads with confidence. Head to the link that you can see right on the screen to book your spot for Facebook ads, one-on-one -on -one coaching with me. All right, back to the video. And I don't feel shame around that. I had to do that. Like I mentioned, like I'm a single mom. I support a lot of people, but I was like, what, now that I've set my business up in a way that I can take time off, what am I going to do with that time off? And that's another exciting thing that I've spent, you know, the last year uh, trying to figure out of like, what does Liz like outside of making money? <laughs> oh, I mean, reality, reality show pro, like there's some other good ones you could hop on. You know, maybe, you know, Survivor is the only one I've ever wanted to be on. Like, it was, and it wasn't even about being on TV. I wanted to play Survivor. Like, I'm a, I'm a Survivor geek. And I, I really, I was like, I know I could be on that show. I know that I could do really well. I probably know I could win. Like, just give me a shot, Jeff. <laughs> so as far as like other shows, like, uh, I mean, if somebody called, I have a big ego. I probably wouldn't say no, but uh, Survivor is really the only show I ever wanted to be on because I love the game. Wow. So I got mad amounts of respect for, I want to talk about Survivor more, but I'm just going to hard segue into, I got mad amounts of respect. I was raised by a single mom. Oh, thanks. So, yeah. It's, that's not, that's not, I could ask so many questions right now. <laughs> well, I want to ask you questions. Oh, okay. All right. I am dying to know. So I started following you a few months ago. How do you know so many languages? I feel like, how, well, how many languages do you know? Uh, what does no, what does no mean? How many, okay. How many can you speak fluently and feel like you can have an intelligent conversation with someone like this? Okay. So I, oh, like this only English and Mandarin Chinese. Oh, only. <laughs> well, if you're saying like this, I can, I can still do a podcast interview if I needed to in Chinese. It's a bit rough now because it's been like since uh, January of 2020 that I lived in China. Oh, you would pick it back up. I would. It's just now. For sure. I read some if books. That's back of brain stuff, you know? I hope so. The only Mandarin I speak is with my son. We still speak every day, but... It, it's hard because he's growing up. We're here in Mexico, right? And so uh, he's growing up and he's in school for whatever, eight, seven hours a day. So the language thing, like after speaking to a three-year-old and a four-year-old for uh, so long, it's like my language has just gone down the toilet. Not that like he has a potty mouth. I feel like all these puns, you know, I should be from Britain. Um <laughs> Or I'm just a dad with bad dad jokes. But it's it's just so simple, the language we say. And it's so repetitive, you know, like the basic kid routine. How old are your kids? Uh, I, ha I have one daughter who's nine. Okay. So I'm almost there. My daughter turns eight in like a month. Um, but yeah, the language just got simple. Have you heard the analogy about learning foreign language? Like a foreign language is like a tree? No. Okay, so imagine like this oak tree that's like 100 years old. And so it's quite big. It's quite robust. And that's how a foreign language is once you grow the language and put in the time. But when you pull yourself either out of the environment where the language is spoken or the manufactured environment that you've created to grow your language, you know, like a mix of TV shows and daily practices and tutors and college classes maybe and all this, let's call it um, input, then the tree starts to die and it always dies like trees in real life. Um, the leaves go first. Like, or if you think about like a tree, when fall time comes, um, this would be whatever the opposite of a deciduous tree is the leaf bearing trees. The it's the, the little leaves fall off first, right? They turn color. Um, and then they, and then they fall off. And that represents like the, the very, the fine vocabulary that you have, the, the adjective that you really only use once in a while, you know, those start to go first. And then like, then if a tree is dying, it's the branches that fall off next um, or that rot. And then the, finally the bigger branches and then it's the trunk. Right. And so like the trunk represents 
the easiest things, the things in a language that you use the most often. And so like my Mandarin has been dying, but I can still use it pretty well. I mean, I was speaking it there for like 12 years. So how many languages do I know? Just two, English and Mandarin. Um, I'm pretty good, like upper intermediate with Spanish. And uh, that just means I can't like get in a fight. And I probably, anytime like my brain would get stressed, my language still deteriorates if it's Spanish. And so like, I'm not going to take care of like pipes flooding or like, God forbid the house is on fire. And like, I have to call the fire department. Like at that point, I would just like, my you probably start speaking Mandarin. <laughs> I would, you know? I Under can do stress. that in Mandarin, though, is a thing. I can do that in Mandarin. Well, if you're in Mexico, I'm sure it will come. Well, hopefully, something would come out and get the fire department to come. You know? Right, right. Fuego, fuego ahora. There we go. You got some Spanish skills. So I actually want to counter what you said. Because I feel like it's all there. Like, sure, like, it's just asleep. You know, it's like some of those, like, plants and animals that can freeze and then they come back to life. Like, instead of, like, a tree, it's like, you know, something like, you know, bears go into hibernation and their whole system slows down. And so, like, I don't consider myself a Spanish speaker at all. But I did learn Spanish in first, second, and third grade. Um which I think is why my accent isn't terrible. Uh, like it's not the best, but it isn't terrible. People can usually understand me. And then I spoke it in, you know, in, in America, you have to take, uh, you know, a foreign language in school. So I took it there again. Uh, and then it just lay dormant. You know, it's, it, this is, I ask you, cause this is my greatest regret in life is not speaking another language fluently. I feel like it makes, it makes me feel very ignorant. <laughs> um, and so I know I'm not, um, but ignorant as in like unknowing and limited, not ignorant as in stupid. Um, and I um, I fostered a, a girl from Guatemala and having her in my house and having to speak with her dad, I was like, wow, I know a lot more Spanish or I can learn it a lot faster than I thought I would. And I think it's because those, you know, those roots are deep, you know, maybe back of brain stuff and it was just frozen. And, and the tree, if we're going to use Quajo's example, like, is coming back to life much faster than if it had, hadn't been planted at all. So I think you're good, boo. I, I think, you know, give you 48 hours, you know, in a city that only speaks Mandarin and you'd be, you'd be fine. Well, thank you. Thank you. And don't worry about an accent. Like I have an accent, you have an accent. We worry about accent so much but it's like, there's that quote, like, um, it's like, do you know what a foreign accent is? It's a sign of bravery. Yes. I love that so much. I love that so much. I have to tell myself that too, because I get outside and I, I really love to have a good accent, but there's just plenty of times. I remember my wife and I were joking with uh, a neighborhood friend who was over playing a board game and uh, we were joking. This is very recently, actually. So, you know, Semana Semana Santa, which is like Holy Week, but in Spanish, because Semana is week and Santa is holy, right? Um, Mexico being like, at least historically, like a Catholic country. And so Holy Week's a big thing here, just like it is in the Philippines. My team just got back from their vacation. And uh, my wife and I were joking that what we're going to do is get Santa hats and put them on and then hand them out to like Mexicans and just see what would happen Santa. if like we we're like happy semana santa and we would say it with our gringo foreigner accents and just see if like people would get upset or if people would like laugh and think it looks funny and so we were telling this to our friend who is a mexican and we're like yeah we're gonna like you know speak with our gringo accents and she's like just speak with your normal gringo accents and i was like how dare you i don't have a gringo accent i've been working hard on this thing <laughs> shots fired shots fired that's so funny. I was in Mexico uh, with a friend and he didn't really speak Spanish at all. He had taken some classes beforehand and I had been practicing and, you know, I'm like 
every day, like trying to perfect my accent. And uh, we were we were with this guy who was hosting our Airbnb, and uh, you know he was another American, but he said it like hurt me. I couldn't sleep at night. He said, "Oh, I think I think your friend here has a better accent than you," because in my head, my friend sounded like an idiot, <laughs> like, like so bad, like, hola, como estas, uh, you know, me gusta, you know, like very, like it just, the accent was not accenting. And so I was like, oh my gosh, you think he sounds better than me? What do I sound like? I was having a crisis because my whole life I was like, you know, I don't know a lot of Spanish, but dang it, when I speak it, I sound all right. <laughs> And he was like, no, this guy sounds way better than you. It, like, it was like a crisis of identity. <laughs> but you're totally right. You know, having an accent is being like showing how brave you are because it is really scary to, you know, feel like you're going to sound stupid or ignorant or limited, right? It truly is. So, yeah, I guess it's the answer to your question. Mandarin, Spanish. French, uh, Mandarin took French or kicked French out of my brain, but I used to work in Paris a long, 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 long time ago. And then, uh, that's about all the languages I have going on. So where are you at in the States right now? I live in Orlando. Shout out to Mickey. Okay. You're like super close to, actually, I don't think they have direct flights from Orlando to Mexico. I'm sure they do. Would you, would you, would you, would you ever like come down here and hang out? Oh my gosh. I would love. Yeah. So I actually, I went to visit Mexico because I wanted to move there. I wanted my daughter to be fluent and I, I want to be fluent too. Um, I, I sought out a school. I visited a few schools actually. Uh, in the end we couldn't move. Um, my daughter's dad eventually vetoed it even though I was like, you can come with us. <laughs> like, come on, this is going to be awesome. But he just wasn't about it. He's not as adventurous as I, as I am. Um, but I would, I would love to one day. And I even live in a neighborhood that is prominently uh, Latin. And like, whenever I go out, like I hear more Spanish where I live than English. It's not unless I go, you know, to like Disney or, or outside of my neighborhood, like both of my neighbors, I don't, I like, I'm not even sure that they speak English. Uh, so it's a very Latin neighborhood. I go to the supermarket, everything's in Spanish, you know, the signs, the name, you know. Um, and so I, I'm trying to be as immersive as possible uh, for still living in America. I feel like the Latino community is super welcoming. Like there's probably so many opportunities to speak Spanish, like just right there where you live, you know? Oh, all the time. Every time I go to a restaurant or a store, I speak Spanish or say, oh, can I practice my Spanish with you? And, you know, they're always, especially like if you're not watching the video, I'm pretty pale. <laughs> and so they're like, wow, you know, this is awesome. She's trying to learn, you know, our language, be immersed in our culture. So I think they're incredibly welcoming. And, uh, you know, don't listen to the media, y'all. Like Florida is actually incredibly diverse. And like there's some really amazing cultures and people here. I, I, I love living here. We were looking for a tutor for my son and we had to join, I had to join like, um, there's this app that people in China use called WeChat. And so I was on the app and I looked for a group that was here in the city I live in, uh, central Mexico called Queretaro. And I found a group of Chinese folks and jumped in and started sending like messages like, Hey, would somebody be a tutor for my kid? You know, like, in their free time. And so that's how I found a language tutor for my son. Not that he needed it initially, but just to provide more exposure to Mandarin Chinese. And like, I bet if it makes economic sense for you, there's somebody, you know, who could just speak Spanish with your daughter. Um, come over to your house, go through some material, like, you know, like that's, it's, yeah. Yeah. I love, I love that idea. Cause she actually goes to a bilingual school, which is why we moved here. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not, 
It's not as much as I would like, you know, I thought it was going to be complete immersion. Uh, and it's not Is it certain subjects like, like science and math are all in Spanish and the rest are in English. What they do is there's, there's a teacher that speaks English in her classroom and there's a teacher that speaks Spanish in her classroom. Uh, but her classroom is kind of large. So I feel like sometimes they just speak English to her, you know, when I'm like, you could speak Spanish to her. I don't care if, you know, she gets behind, she'll speed back up. Um, but um, I think that they were having difficulties. They they said they used to be immersion, um, but when the kids got to middle school, uh, because they had never like learned in English, they were really struggling and the public schools didn't like that or whatever. I don't know. Um, but anyway, I, I've been looking for someone outside of her school, just an extra hour a day to, you know, converse. So WeChat, I'm writing that down right now. Oh, well, WeChat's, WeChat's. Oh, that's, is that just for Asia? Because I've heard of that before. WeChat is the oh, social media Chinese. app for, it's, okay. it's just a Chinese thing. You're not going to find anyone else on WeChat. <laughs> if, you want to, if you want to meet the Chinese community, then get WeChat. But but I don't I don't know where. I, I would I, I don't know where you would start. Like I've never gone an official route to find a tutor. Like I've always just asked the, asked around. Like, hey, do you got a grandma who's free? Right. I could just ask my neighbors. I'm sure. <laughs> right. Yeah. Because anybody who is like an adult or like a college student, for for example, for example, um, can easily take like nine year old material. Well, actually, not so easy. Nine year olds, <laughs> what they're learning is actually really advanced but you know what i'm saying like to just take a book and provide conversation around that or any other extracurricular materials you have could be could be a good move could be a good move yeah thanks for reinvigorating my spirit around this i'm excited <laughs> you talk to me about language or moving like i'm likely to try to convince you to study more engage more in language or just move somewhere like if I wasn't teaching Facebook ads or being a Facebook ad manager, it probably would be start a YouTube channel about learning foreign language and just, you know, get sponsorships that way and try to get people to learn more of whatever foreign language they're passionate about. Because it's, you know, communicating with people, like re redoing our brains to like peer through like the cultural window and see like the world as it's been set up in like the minds of people who come from like a completely different culture than ours. It's such a gift and like such an amazing experience and challenging, but it's, it's addicting. And like, I just would do it over and over and over again. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah. I, I, that's why I was had an RV travel blog. I love to travel. I love to experience new places and new everything. Unfortunately, I'm in a situation where I can't, just leave the country. Um, but you're darn tootin'. Like my, my whole plan is to retire in 10 years when my daughter graduates and like, you'll never see me again. Like, <laughs> cause I'll just, I'll be, well, a lot of new people will meet me, uh, in all sorts of cultures. And I just, I just love that stuff. I geek out on it as well. So. So walk us back to after you, Actually, I don't know the order, but I'm assuming you applied to be on Survivor first and then they said yes. And then you were like, holy crap, this is a three month commitment. What do I got to do? Like, how did how did that work? So I've always wanted to be on Survivor and I always knew that if I applied, I would be on, you know, sometimes there's just, there's just things, you know, <laughs> um, and if you've ever seen Survivor and you Google me, you'll be like, Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, they would definitely cast her. <laughs> and so, um, but my life has never been in a place where I could take time off of work, right? I've always supported my family. I've always been the, you know, the sort of like stable matriarch, even when I was a kid. And I, a few years ago, I started watching Survivor with my daughter when we got out of the RV. I said, oh my gosh, we have cable. We can watch Survivor. And we started watching it together. And, you know, the host, his name's Jeff Probst. He comes on and he says, is this your dream? I think you could do well. Apply now. 
And probably for the millionth time, I said, oh, gosh, I, I really think I could do well on that show. And my daughter, she was seven at the time. She turned to me and she said, well, mom, are you going to talk about it or are you going to do it? Oh, she called you out. She called me out. She, she's, she's going places for sure. And I said, you know what? Actually, and I pulled out my calendar and I said, you know what? Somebody canceled at 9 a.m. That's a sign. I'm going to, I'm going to apply. And so I applied, <laughs> I applied the next morning and, oh, well, it was funny. Cause I said, I'm going to do it at 9am. And my daughter said, yeah, well, I'll believe it when I see you on the TV. You're seven year old. Yes. And I was like, okay, bet sis bet. <laughs> As if applying means to just get on the show, but you did. Yeah. And while, so I mentioned all this preface, like I preface all this because I applied and they emailed me less than 15 minutes later. So when I said I knew I was going to be on the show, I knew I was going to be on the show. So to Quajo's question of like, when did I start planning? The second they emailed me, I was like, okay, I'm about to be on the show. And so I started prepping my business. Um, you know, I, I met with Jeff Propes, the host, a couple weeks after applying. I met with, uh, you know, a medical team, a psych, you know, a psychiatry team, all of this. And that's when I was like, okay, this is definitely going to happen. And it's going to happen in about five months. And so I applied in November. In January, I hired an operations manager. And this is before I've even gotten on the show. But I just know, you know, I've just got a feeling. Sometimes you just have that gut feeling, you know, this is the direction that you were meant to go and all doors are opening. And so I hired her to get everything out of my brain and, you know, put it into, uh, you know, something else, like put it into, I think we use Notion now. And so that whole process, honestly, it took about three months for us to create all the operations, uh, you know, the standard procedures, uh, you know, to map out what was going to happen in those because it was only a five week commitment, but I knew I wanted to take at least 60 days off. I knew I wasn't going to be able to come back and just get right back into work. Uh, if you've ever seen Survivor, it's a very cutthroat game. It's incredibly manipulative and a lot. And I'd heard stories of a lot of people not being able to come back to real life for a long time because it's an immersive experience uh, where you're literally like lying and cheating and deceiving to win a million dollars. <laughs> and so I, I knew I wanted to plan for 60 days. I'm a little extra if you can't tell. And so I actually mapped out 90 days where I wouldn't have to come back to work. I worked my butt off uh, from about April uh, to May uh, to write everything and automate it and, you know, have my assistant feel really good about me leaving. And yeah, I was gone for 90 days. How confident were you that this all would hold up? while you were gone let's like what What was that what what what, what did you feel like uh, four weeks before you were scheduled to leave and you had you said you had your online business manager who else did you hire yeah so i have i have an assistant who's actually my sister so i trust her with my life um and then i hired an operations manager and that's it i run a very simple business um, I have an incredibly simple offer. It's nine dollars a month, um, and you know, at this point in the game, I think it was over two years old at the time. And I just, you know, created the content to go in for the next three months, um, and I just trusted the team uh, because we're really small. You know, we're talking very, you know, all the time, uh, lots of one-on-one -on -one to make sure everything uh, goes well. And how confident was I? I'd say 99.9%. .9%. Again, I run, a, I run a really simple business. I'm not really, I'm not running Facebook ads that might break. I'm not, you know, I didn't, I didn't schedule any like partnerships that had to happen while I was away. It was literally just emails being sent out. Um, and most of them I had swiped from myself emails that I had written three years prior that I already knew were performing. <laughs> and um, so we just kept a lot of things like bare bones. We told the audience, hey, Liz is going away for the summer. Uh, she's not going to be here at all. And so like we have to lean on each other. 
um, and, you know, pointing people to a Facebook group, making sure, you know, I actually gave my sister a raise and she was able to quit her other job to work for me full time so that she was in the business. And so I think being on Survivor, again, I was gone five weeks and this is five weeks without a cell phone. So I have no, right. And so, and they told our friends and family, you know, only call if it's an actual emergency, because if you call and we connect with the, your person, if we, you know, connect with Liz, Liz will be pulled from the game and no longer eligible to play. And so it was like, unless my child is about to die, like if she breaks an arm, don't call me. If she breaks a leg, don't call me. If she suddenly has a uh, leukemia, call me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And so it was five weeks without uh, any contact with the outside world. And I think I thought about my business and what was happening one time in those five weeks. 